Hey everybody, how's it going? I'm Paul, I'm with the Dicey Review, and today we're going to be learning how to play the 1-4 player game Futuropia, being released by Stronghold Games in the US and also 2F Spiele. Futuropia comes with all of the components that you see here, including 42 food tiles, 48 robots, 112 people, 33 loan tiles, 42 energy tiles, money in one of three different values, one subsidy board, one market board, 37 living quarters in different sizes, 20 action tiles, 17 total special tiles and variant tiles, one camper, three subsidy and price markers, and 64 total generators. These are divided into food generators and energy generators. It's important to note that there are some generators, both food and energy, that are meant to be used in variant gameplay. These variant tiles are clearly labeled with a yellow back of the tile. In addition to this, there are four special tiles that are marked with a red backside. Finally, there are four overview tiles and starting living quarters and generator tiles. All of the starting tiles will have an exclamation point listed at the bottom of the tile. And in addition, the starting generators will have a light gray back. For the standard game, only gather the generators that have a brown back or a light gray back. The three tiles with a light gray back will also have an exclamation point in the center. These tiles are used for starting setup and can be placed to the side for now. Then remove any tiles that don't match the player count. So for instance, in our example, we're going to be showing a two player game. Any tile that says two plus will stay and any tile that says three or four can be put back in the box. The same is true for living quarters. Each of the starting living quarters will have an exclamation point. You'll need to gather one for each player. And just like the generators, any living quarter showing a 3 or a 4 can be removed if you're playing a two-player game. Begin setup by placing the market board in the middle of the play area. Each generator will have a price that must be paid to purchase the generator. Place the food generator with a price of 4 to the left of the market board, and the food generator with a price of 5 to the right of the market board. It's important to note in a 3 and a 4 player game, there will be more than one tile for each stack. Then, place the energy generators with a price of 6 and 7 to the left and right of the market board. Next, find the subsidy board and turn it to the side showing the correct player count. Place this in the middle of the play area. Next, lay out all of the generators according to their value. This will matter during gameplay as generators are refilled from the next highest value. It's also important to note that in 3 and 4 player games there may be multiple tiles in each stack. For instance, there's more than one tile in this stack. Next, place all of the living quarters that are appropriate for your player type within easy reach of all players. Next, find a place to place your supply of food, energy, loans, people, robots, and money. Place one of the red markers on the zero space of both market tracks, then place one marker on the starting space of the subsidy track. It's highlighted in green. The last step before playing is setting up each player's condominium and starting resources. Each player will take one of the living quarters that has the exclamation point and make sure and play on the side that says A. Below the living quarters, each player will place one energy generator with a production of one and two food generators with a production of one and two. These tiles once again will have an exclamation point as well. Place three people in the working spaces of the generators. Each of these three people has a living space in the quarters above. Players will also receive these five action tiles, one overview tile, three food, three energy, and twelve dollars. The second player will get an additional dollar, and in a three and a four player game, the third player would get two extra dollars, and the fourth player would get three extra dollars. Now that we've learned how to set up, let's learn how to play the game, including looking at the five actions in detail. Beginning with the start player, and then proceeding clockwise around the table, each player will take a turn. There are no rounds in this game. A turn consists of a player turning one of their face-up action tiles face down and then taking the associated action. For instance, on their turn, a player could turn this action tile face down, take the associated action, and then 
the player next in clockwise order would take their turn. On their next turn, the player would then select one of the remaining four face-up action tiles to turn face down and take an action with. Once a player has used all five action tiles, turning them face down at the start of their turn, they would flip all five tiles face up for free before they take their next action. They could then select from any of the five tiles again. It's also important to note that players can pay to flip their tiles face up even if they haven't used all five. We'll look at how to do that later. Players will continue to flip tiles and use actions until the final phase of the game is triggered. Now that we've looked at a general turn overview, let's look at what each action tile does in detail. The first two action tiles that we want to look at are these two action tiles. This action tile allows you to buy a food generator and test run for food production. And this action tile allows you to buy an energy generator and test run for energy production. Let's look at the food generator action first. To take the action, the player would first flip their action tile. This action tile allows you to buy up to one energy generator at the market cost. Currently, this generator costs $4, and this generator costs $5. The player would pay the cost of the generator from their money, and then place the generator to the right of their other generators under their condominium. If a player buys the more expensive generator on the right side of the market, move the price marker on the corresponding market track up one space. This track will increase the cost of any of the expensive generators by the number shown, and it will decrease the cost of any of the less expensive generators by this number shown. So for instance, if another player wanted to buy this generator, it would now cost one less. It's important to note that if the marker ever reaches the last space, it can never go any higher. If a player were to buy the last generator from the cheap generator stack, the market price is reset to zero. If a player ever empties one of the stacks in the market, players will refill that market space immediately. If the cheaper space in the market is empty, first move the generator from the more expensive space to the cheaper space. Then refill the expensive side of the market with the next most expensive generator, in this case the 7. It's also important to note that a player can never have more than 7 generators below their condominium. If a player would ever buy an 8th generator, they must first pick a generator to discard from below their living quarters. After a player buys a generator, they can freely rearrange any of the people or robots that they might have below their condominium. We'll look at how to gain robots in a few minutes. So for instance, this player could move the person working the generator that produces one to the generator that now produces three. It's also important to note that a player can pass on buying a generator when taking this action. If they do, simply move the price marker up by one space and then make a test run for food production. The next step of this action is making a test run for food production. After a player buys a generator, or if they decide to pass on buying a generator, they will then make a test run for food production. It's important to note that test runs are mandatory for all actions. Players can't pass on that part of the action. For each fully occupied generator, the generator will produce as much food as is shown on the production value. So for instance, this player would generate five food when testing for food production. They could take this food and place it in their supply. It's important to note that if a generator is not occupied by either a person or a robot, it won't produce anything during this test run. It's also important to note that there are some generators with two working spaces. A player must fully occupy each working space for this generator to produce. So for instance, if only one of the working spaces were occupied, this generator would produce nothing. And it's also important to note that if a player has enough robots and or people to occupy the working spaces of a generator, they have to occupy them. The next action to look at is buying an energy generator and then testing for energy production. This action works in the exact same way as the food action, but you're buying energy and producing energy instead. So for instance, a player could turn this action tile face down, pay $7 to the bank to pay for the cost of this energy generator, since the player bought the expensive generator, they would move the price marker up by one, and then immediately refill this side of the market with the next most expensive generator. They could then place this generator to the right of their generators below their living quarters. They only have five of the total seven allowed generators, so they don't have to discard anything yet. Then this player is allowed to freely rearrange any of their workers and robots. 
They could, for instance, choose to rearrange their workers like this. And then finally, they make a test run for energy production. Since this energy generator is fully occupied, and this energy generator is fully occupied, this player would generate six energy. After doing all this, this action is complete as well. The next action tile to look at is taking a subsidy. Taking a subsidy is a very straightforward action. First, the player would turn the action tile face down. Then, the player will take money from the supply equal to the subsidy value on the track. In this example, the player would gain $12. After taking a subsidy, a player moves the subsidy marker one space to the right. This increases the value of the subsidy received for the next player. The subsidy value will keep on increasing throughout the game, and if it ever reaches the final 22 space, it doesn't increase anymore. This is the maximum amount of money players can receive during the game. The next action to look at is the Take Robots and Test Run for Energy action. To take this action, first flip the action tile face down. Then the player is allowed to take one to three robots from the supply. Then the player can freely place these robots in the working spaces of generators. It's important to note that if a generator has a working space that shows this symbol, it must be occupied by a person. But the player could, for instance, move the person here and then place the robots as we see here. And it's important to note that players are allowed to take robots even if they don't have space for them. They can simply place them on their generators to be used later when they receive more generators. The next step of this action is making a test run for energy consumption. To do this, a player has to pay one energy for every robot they have and pay the energy cost of all of their living quarters. So for instance, this player would have to pay one, two, three, four energy when making an energy consumption test run. To do this, a player would simply take the energy from their supply and pay it back to the general supply. It's important to note that if during this test run, players don't have enough energy to pay for their energy costs, they have to pay $2 for each missing energy. If the player doesn't have enough money, then they have to take an out of sequence loan. We'll look at what that means here in a moment. It's also important to note that some living quarters consume more energy than others. So make sure and pay attention to this when gaining new living quarters. Now that we've looked at the other four actions, let's look at the last action, inviting people and making a test run for food. When taking this action, you can flip the tile over and then simply take one to five people from the supply. It's important to note that the number of living spaces in your living quarters always has to be at least as big as the number of people that you have. At the start of the game, you have three living spaces and you have three people. As part of this action, you can buy new living quarters. When buying living quarters, you can select from any in the supply. Living quarters will have a cost to purchase them, many living quarters will require energy to run, and some living quarters will provide points for in-game scoring. Some living quarters will take away points at the end of the game as well, so pay close attention when buying living quarters. You can buy as many living quarters as you want to during this action. The only limit is how much you can afford or want to spend, and the fact that you can only have up to five unoccupied living spaces in the living quarters in your condominium. So for instance, after placing all of the people that came to live in our condominium on a living space, we have two unoccupied living spaces, which means that we could only buy a living quarters tile with up to three spaces. We couldn't buy any more as that would put us over five unoccupied spaces. After inviting people to live with you and buying any number of living quarters that you want to up to your limit, you have to do a test run for feeding. To test for feeding, you have to pay one food for every person living in your condominium. If you don't have enough food, you have to pay $2 for each missing food to acquire it from the outside. And if you don't have enough money, you have to take loans out of sequence. In our example, we need eight food and we have exactly eight in our supply. After paying this food to the supply, the action is finished. Now I want to briefly discuss taking a loan out of sequence. If you don't have enough money to complete an action, you can take any number of loans on your turn. There's no limit to the number of loans that you can have during the game. So let's say, for instance, that we were taking the turn to invite more people to our condominium. It cost $11 to put these two living quarter tiles in our condominium. But we still have space for three more people. There's a living quarters tile that has three spaces for people and costs no energy. 
This tile, however, costs $14, and currently we only have one. If a player wanted to, they could take three loan tiles from the supply, which would immediately give them $15, enough to buy and place this living quarters in their condominium. These loan tiles will stay in the player's play area, and every time the player's action tiles are turned face up, the player has to pay interest for any remaining loan tiles. Taking loan tiles can be very beneficial for players, however, as you can see in this example, it allowed this player to expand their condominium to its limit. Now that we've briefly mentioned loans, how to take them and what they can do for you, let's talk about flipping our action tiles face up. During the game, players will take actions, and when doing so, they will turn their action tiles face down. A player can't use an action tile that is face down, but there are two ways that a player can turn their tiles face up at the start of their turn. The first way is very simple. If a player has used all five of their action tiles, they immediately get to turn all five face up for free. In this instance, the player would be able to select from any of the five face up tiles. A player is also able to turn their action tiles face up even if they haven't used all five of them. If a player wants to, they can turn their action tiles face up early by paying resources. Let's say for instance that this player wanted to turn these three tiles face up again so that they could use one of these actions on their turn. To do this, a player has to pay one resource of their choice for every tile that is face up in their play area. These resources can either be money, food, or energy. So in this instance, since there are two tiles face up, this player would have to pay two resources. They could either pay two energy, or they could pay two dollars. This player decides to pay two dollars to the supply, which allows them to take one of these actions again. It's important to note that every time tiles are turned face up, whether all five were used or whether players turn them face up early, a player has to pay interest for any loans that they have outstanding. A player must pay one resource of their choice for each loan tile that they have. The resources can be either money, food, or energy. So in this instance, a player would have to pay three resources for their outstanding loans. This player decides to turn this token in and get two back. You can also pay back loan tiles directly after paying interest. In fact, this is the only time that you can pay back loan tiles, directly after paying interest. For each loan tile that you want to pay back, you have to pay five resources of your choice, any combination of money, food, or energy. So let's say, for instance, that this player has just paid the interest for these three loans, and they want to pay off some of their loans. If they had this $10 bill, they could pay this to the supply, and pay off two of their loans. Now, whenever they turn their action tiles face up in the future, they only have to pay interest for one loan. It's also important to note that any remaining loan tiles in a player's play area score them negative victory points at the end of the game. The final phase of the game will be triggered in one of two ways. The first way to trigger the end of the game is to place the final and most expensive energy or food generator of $15 into the market. When players deplete this supply by buying the last generator, that will trigger the final phase. The other way is if people have 25 or more people in their condominium. If either one of these triggers happens, all players immediately turn all of their face down action tiles face up for free. It is important to note that the player who caused the end of the game has to leave the tile that triggered this end face down. Only the other four tiles that they have can be turned face up. It's important to note that at this time no one has to pay interest, but nobody can pay back loans either. Players are now in the final phase of the game. Each player has a chance to use all of their remaining action tiles one more time. After each player has used all of their actions a final time, they pull out of the game. A player can also forfeit their remaining actions and end their game ahead of time. For instance, this player could leave these two tiles face up and pull out of the game. Any face up action tile at the end of the game will give players extra points. Immediately after a player pulls out of the game, they have to pay interest for their loans a final time. So for instance, this player would have to pay one interest for their one remaining loan. After doing this, the players can pay back as many of their loans as possible with any remaining resources.
After all players have pulled out of the game, they can complete final scoring. The first step of final scoring is to determine if your condominium is self-sustaining. Players' food and energy generators at the end of the game must supply all of the food and energy requirements for their condominium. Players have no access to their remaining resources. First, players have to determine if they produce enough energy to supply all of their living quarters and robots. In this instance, this condominium has an energy demand of 13. This is because of their eight robots and five required energy for their living quarters. This person is generating 22 energy, so their energy costs are self-sustaining. If a player didn't generate enough energy to supply their living quarters and their robots with energy, they have to remove one robot for each missing energy that they can't generate. If they remove all of their robots and still can't generate enough energy, they have to start removing living quarters. It's also important to note that when removing robots, the robots have to be replaced with people. Then players must determine if their food generators generate enough food for all of their people. In this instance, we have 18 people living in this condominium and generate 19 food with our generators. So this condominium is self-sustaining. Players have to remove any people that they can't feed at the end of the game. Players will then count up their victory points. For every person who doesn't have to work anymore, score five victory points. A person isn't working if they're standing in the living quarters above or if a robot is doing their work. If players' generators produce surplus energy and or surplus food, each of these surplus productions counts as a victory point. Living quarters will provide the number of victory points that are printed on them. Each loan tile that a player has will count as three negative victory points. If a player pulled out of the game early and voluntarily passed on some of their actions, each face-up action tile counts as three victory points. And finally, players will add up all of their resources, money, food, and energy, and divide the total by 10. They will score one victory point for each 10 resources. The player with the most victory points is the winner. In the case of a tie, the players will share the victory. These are the instructions for the basic game mode of Futuropia. Once players are more comfortable with the base game, you can explore the upgraded game and the expert game in the rulebook. All right, everyone, that was our video. Thanks so much for watching. We hope that it was helpful and we hope that it was informative. If you still have any questions about how to play, please comment below or email us directly at thediceyreview at gmail.com. If you want to hear more from the Dicey Review, you can listen to our podcast. It can be found on iTunes, Stitcher, Tuned In, SoundCloud, pretty much any podcasting app. You can read our written reviews at thediceyreview.com and make sure and connect with us on social media or at our Board Game Geek Guild. Thanks so much for watching and until next time, we'll see you at the table.